As we spent the past two Sundays exploring what it means to be the church outside of the walls of the church, a recurring theme I've noticed is that this necessarily involves modeling what we do after what God has done. Much like my whole generation modeled what we did on the basketball court after what Michael Jordan had done. As we seek to be the church outside of the church building, we who have been made in the image of God are to become more like God, more like that image we bear by copying, by doing the kinds of things God does. For instance, two weeks ago we talked about the need to build relationships with strangers, and, and in doing that, to find that those strangers aren't really strangers at all, but rather our family. Now why would we do that? Well, because isn't that what God has first done for us? Um, as Paul writes in Ephesians 2, he says, Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. When we were strangers, God reached out to us and built our relationship with us so that we might no longer be strangers, but would be part of God's family. And so becoming more like God, growing more fully into the image of God, means increasingly doing to others as God has done to us. So reaching out to strangers and treating them as family as God has done to us. Last week we talked about loving our neighbors, not as we might wish they were, but as they actually are. And again, why would we do that? Well, because that's what God has done for us. When we take communion, some of the words that we say sometimes are, Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, while we were still sinners. And that proves God's love toward us. What it means is that God didn't wait until we were perfect. God didn't wait until we were the, the people who God knew we could ultimately be before God would love us and build relationships with us. We constantly fail and we fall short. But even before we reach perfection, God has chosen to initiate relationship with us, not as God wishes we were, but as we actually are. And so becoming more like God, growing more fully into his image, means imitating God by, by extending relationship and love to our neighbors. As imperfect as they are. As they are. Today, as we explore how to become more like the God whose image we bear by hearing and responding to the cries of our neighbors, just as God hears and responds to our cries, we're guided by a parable of Jesus, a story that Jesus made up a long time ago to, to make a point. And in that story, which we just heard, um, God talked about this judge who didn't care about people and didn't care about God. And time and time again, this widow, one of the most vulnerable people in society in that time would come to him and say, hey, help me. Grant me justice. Right my wrongs. And time and time again, the judge would say, nah. I don't care. I'm not going to do anything. But the widow kept coming and coming and coming and so finally, the judge said, you know what? I'm tired of this lady. I want her to leave me alone and so I'm just going to do what she tells me to do. And the unjust judge grants her justice. And presumably, the woman finally leaves him alone. Now, a lot of people have heard that story or have read that story and have compared God to the unjust judge and, and have said, well, if we just pray enough, if we just even bother God enough, then eventually God will hear us and will grant us justice. But I think Jesus' point was not that God was like the unjust judge. I think Jesus' point was that God isn't like the unjust judge. If a person who didn't care about people nevertheless responded to the needs of someone, then how much more attentive would the God who made all of us respond to our needs? If even a judge who didn't give a rip about justice would grant justice, then how much more willing is our God of justice willing to hear and respond to the needs of God's people. The 
story isn't so much about our need to be persistent in prayer as it is about God's persistence to hear us no matter what our cries are called on, time and time again. Now, that theme of God hearing God's people as they cry out runs throughout our Bibles. You can open up to just about any page and find a story about God being attentive to the cries of God's people. But one that many people have heard is, is the one from a long time ago when, when God's people were being beaten into the ground as slaves in Egypt. And they were, they were struggling. They were crying out to God. And our scriptures say their cry for help rose up to God. God heard their groaning and God took notice of them. And God responded to the cries of those people and led them out of slavery and the freedom and the promised land. There's another story that I wasn't as familiar with. When, when I was in seminary, I interned at this emergency homeless shelter for, for women and their children um, who were homeless. And the name of that shelter was Hagar's House. And it took me a while to connect the dots that it was named after a, a, a single unwed mother from the Old Testament. Many people are familiar with the story of Father Abraham. I know Probably about two months back, we all got up and we sang Father Abraham. If you want, we can do that again. Uh, I guess nobody just wants to do it. Okay. Um, but many people are familiar with the story of Abraham and how God said, you know, I'll give you a son. And, and you will have more descendants um, than, than the number of stars in the sky, right? And after that, that story, Abraham looked at his wife Sarah and said, well, she's too old, so God could possibly mean that she's going to be the mother of of this child. And so he and their slave girl, Hagar, had a son. But then after Sarah had a son, Isaac, Sarah and Abraham sent Hagar off into the desert with her little infant son, Ishmael. Presumably to fend for themselves. Well, at one point in that story that we hardly ever read, um, Hagar is there with her child. And she realizes this child isn't going to make it. I'm going to have to watch my child die. And then that little child cries. And our scriptures say this. God heard the voice of the boy. And then Hagar heard a voice that said, Do not be afraid. For God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. God heard their cries, even at their most desperate moment. Time and time again throughout Scripture and throughout history, and I think throughout our lives, our God is a God who hears us when we cry out. And God hears our cries because as we demonstrated in the children's time this morning, God is close enough to us to hear our cries. Think about it. If somebody is even just a quarter of a mile down the road right now and they cry out for help, you and I wouldn't hear it. Why? Because we're not close enough. But if they were right in here among us, then we would hear them a lot more clearly. Well, God can hear our cries because God is close enough to hear. Um, and as our gospel stories tell us, God is one who in the person of Jesus Christ came and dwelled among us. God is one who is still among us through the power of the Holy Spirit. God hears our cries because God is with us. God is right here among us, close enough to and my friends, if that is who God is, one who is near enough to hear us when we cry out, then as people made in the image of God and striving to grow more fully into that image, we are called to draw near enough to others to hear their cries. Two, we're called to draw near enough to find out exactly what it is that makes people's hearts break and makes the tears stream down their cheeks. I believe that's who and what we are called to be. Now, sometimes what we're called to be isn't always who we end up actually being. I was reflecting on the fact that I've grown up in the church for my whole life. And that many times when there were maybe needs in the community, here's, here's what we would do instead of drawing near. A lot of times somebody would have a really good idea and they'd say, you know what? We need to care for our community. Or we need to reach out to our community. And so, 
rather than reaching out and actually talking to people in our community, we would all huddle up inside the church. We call it committee meeting, because usually God only works in committee meetings, right? That's a joke. Um, but we would call committee meetings, and all of us who were already inside of the church would say, I think this is what those people need. And we, we come up with programs and, and, and different, different events and plans for how we were going to meet the needs that we thought people had. And then we put on whatever event it was, and usually nobody would come. And so we, we, we get back together in committee, and we say, you know what, we really need to do better publicity next year when we do this. Or, you know what, we really need to do this better or that better. Never realizing that all that we were doing was coming up for, with solutions for problems that our neighbors didn't actually have. And we would have known that if we'd gotten close enough to actually ask or hear and to listen. I think sometimes we're really good at being in ministry at people, but not being in ministry with people. Um, let me explain what I mean. Um, have you ever talk, had somebody talk with you, right? Like they talk and you listen, and then you get to talk, right? And they listen. And then they probably respond and you respond, and it's this really good back and forth where you grow in your understanding of each other, right? You construct something together. Have you ever had somebody talk at you? Maybe. Like when they talk and you sit there and you wait to get a word in, but they, they, they never stop, and they tell you exactly what you should be thinking and how things really are. And if you do finally have a chance to say something, they don't actually listen to you. They just wait and formulate what they're going to say next to tell you why you're wrong or why other people are wrong, right? There's a difference. Well, I think sometimes that's what we do. Rather than getting close enough where we can hear, we throw things together at our community hoping that something will stay. But if God is one who left a comfortable place to dwell among us and be in relationship with us, then our calling isn't to be in ministry at people. It's to leave our places of comfort and be in ministry with people. It means drawing close enough to our neighbors to hear what they're crying out for. It means crossing the field behind the church or crossing the walls into the schools and places of work and places of living that every one of our neighbors go to every single day. Like our God who couldn't be contained in the walls of a temple. It means getting outside of our own walls, whether the ones we have around us now or the ones we construct in our lives, to take notice of the people we find there just as God took notice those people in Egypt love to go. Now I began with a story about the song, and I want to end with a story about a different song. One that I think more of you perhaps have heard. But nine years ago, my wife Marissa and I had gotten married. We got married in July. I was going to start seminary in August. Um, so the day before my seminary orientation was set to start, we, we moved about 250 miles down Interstate 85, from the Rock Hill area where we had all of our family and all of our friends and all of our roots and headed down to Atlanta, Georgia where we knew absolutely no one. And when we got there, we, we unloaded all of our belongings which fit into two vehicles into our one bedroom apartment that was about the size of this pulpit. <laughs> and, and the next morning, I got up to go to my first day of seminary orientation. I walked out our door up the steps to the parking lot, across the parking lot, to the space where I had parked my car the night before. And it wasn't there. And so I did what anyone who is married would do. I walked back across the parking lot, back down the stairs, back into our apartment, and said, where'd you move my car? <laughs> and she said, I didn't. So I went back up the door, back up the stairs, back across the parking lot to that space where, again, I knew I lived in my car, and it still wasn't there. <laughs> Apparently, on the very first night that we had moved to this new town where we knew absolutely nobody, my car had gotten sold. 
along with the GPS inside that is going to tell us how to get around in this new city. Well, after making countless calls to the police and to the insurance company, Marissa graciously drove me to school in her van. This was a few months before it went up in flames, as I alluded to last Sunday. But as I waited in the chapel there at Emory for our new student orientation to start, I started having a lot of doubts and fears, wondering how on earth are we going to get around? It, you know, this doesn't seem to be an incredibly warm, friendly place. You know, was this the right move? Did we make a huge mistake? Is this whole path to ministry really where I need to be doing? Or was this a clear sign that I need to be doing something else? I started kind of panicking and probably even had some tears streaming down my face. Well, students continued gathering around me even though I wasn't really aware of them. And after a little while, an organ started playing music. And with all the crying out that I had done to God, wondering how and why and whether this was really what God had in mind for us, I stopped crying out for long enough to hear the words that all of those students around me were singing. And they were words that sounded like this. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou
Friends, our faithful God, who provides for every need, is close enough to you to hear whatever cries for help you have. Go forth to be like that God by drawing nearer to those around us that you might hear their needs and respond with God's grace. Go in peace. Thank you.